on today's episodes, the many alliances and rivalries of Boston's inner city neighborhoods. Welcome back everybody. So after that first video, I'm feeling pretty confident that most people want a more in-depth and more detailed video about the subject. Now clearly I've had some assistance in this endeavor. The stuff I'm talking about, at least as far as the rivalries and alliances and who wore what, it cannot be found on the internet. I'm not going to talk about specific individuals and situations that aren't public knowledge, but as far as the other information goes, it's not available. I'm not exaggerating guys. It's not available. I've wanted to make videos about this topic since day one, but I kept coming up against a wall of lack of information. And I'm not sure why, honestly. Like I said, I feel like a lot of people outside of Boston are not aware of this whole other world that exists because literally, it's like two different cities. There's so much content out there about other cities and their situations, but not Boston. And that in a nutshell is the reason for the majority of these videos, and of course so I can have a hobby. And it's a nice little addition to meet a lot of you guys who like the same things that I do. I'm obviously kind of a student of Boston lore, so I do possess a lot of my own knowledge. Some of the guys that I've been talking to are surprised at the stuff that I found out. When I mean that I've scoured the internet for every piece of information, I am not kidding or exaggerating. But without the help that I've received in this video, none of this would be possible. Anyhow, I just really want to thank the person who has done so much to help me with this video. Uh, he wants to remain anonymous, which I do totally understand and respect. But let's get down to the stuff that most of you who are tuning in want to hear about. In the incredibly dangerous environment of the late 80s and early 90s, your most hated enemy could live on the street right next to you. At this time, virtually nowhere in these neighborhoods was safe and neutral. Certain areas far away from the neighborhoods of projects like Downtown Crossing or the Cambridge Side Galleria would be neutral. Basically shopping or entertainment areas that were far away from anyone's territory was safe. Besides that though, fair was fair and in order to survive you needed to know who was who and what was what. Primarily who was from where, what they identified with, who they had smoke with and who they were cool with. These were all key elements to survival in Boston's late 1980s, early 1990s. Now in this video I'm just focusing on a specific time period, but I need to put it out there that some of these neighborhoods are still extremely dangerous. Even though Boston is very safe and parts of the city, these neighborhood rivalries still exist almost 40 years later and the situation is still very real. It's been theorized that this is why there's never really been a big breakout rap star from Boston. Because of all the rivalries in the city, not everyone can support one artist. If a rapper is from a project or hood that your project or hood has smoke with, then you basically can't be a fan. For example, if you're a dude from Lennox, you're probably not going to support a rapper wearing a pirate or Phillies hat. Just saying. It makes people from outside the area think that there's no rap, hip-hop, street culture in the city. Which is not true. There's an incredibly deep, complex, and intricate culture that is completely alive still today. Like I said in the video before, the media painted all these groups out to be criminal organizations, which wasn't the case. And the media also likes to enforce the narrative that this was all part of this bigger problem that was going on in America involving a certain South American product that was mixed with something in most people's refrigerator. This is all about organizations fighting over turf for control of the proceeds of said product, right? Now while yes, that certainly contributed to the escalation of the situation, the reasons for a lot of the violence was usually everyday human adolescent teenage stuff. It just escalated to biblical proportions. Once somebody does something to someone, it becomes a tit for tat situation back and forth, basically in some of these instances, never ending, still 40 years later. 
So naturally, of course, some of these projects and hoods are deeper and bigger than others, which is why forming alliances, especially for the smaller hoods, was absolutely necessary. To use today's rap hip-hop vernacular, some of Boston's top ops in those days were the Bromley Heath Projects, aka Heat Street, who wore Miami Heat gear. The Lennox Housing Projects, who were St. Louis Cardinals gear, who after their projects were torn down, started operating in Mattapan around the Lennox and Ramsey Street area. The Orchard Park Trailblazers, aka OP Trailblazers, who wore the Portland Trailblazers gear. The Academy Terra Home Braves, who wore the Atlanta Braves gear. And the infamous Columbia Point Dogs, who wore Pittsburgh Pirates or Phillies gear. So feared in the city were the dogs that was probably a main factor in Columbia Point being one of the first projects to be demolished during the city's project renovation program. But this just led to the dogs spreading around the city causing havoc. They're still one of the most feared groups in the whole city. Today they also identify as Harbor Point or The Point and sometimes as 8Bus. Those names ring bells certainly, but they're not even a fraction of what was going on in the Boston scene at this time. There were also the Greenwood Street Packers, the Vamp Hill Kings, the Forest Street Dodgers, the Bailey Street Broncos, the Norfolk Bulls, the Eggleston Timberwolves, the Fork Corner Pirates, the Thetford Avenue Bills. Maybe some of these not everyone has heard of. Obviously this will hopefully ring familiar to guys from the era. I heard that Mass Ave claimed the Hornets, but someone else said that they had problems with Tent City Projects who also identify with the Hornets. I'm not really 100% sure, but I think more people are leaning towards Mass Ave being the Hornets. Not every single hood has a sports team. Some just went by the street name or something else. But choosing a sports team was the rule, not the exception. Through the early 90s, the lists of allies and rivals kept expanding and changing to the point of needing an encyclopedia to keep track of it all. There weren't any national organizations, agendas, or politics in Boston. It was a much more personal. Somebody would get into it with somebody from another project, and now their project had problems with the other person's, and it would just escalate from there. The majority of these alliances were simply out of convenience. Like Faston Street had problems with the Magnolia Steelers, and the powerhouse Interval Posse had major problems with the Brunswick Big Head Boys, who were literally right next door to them. This was one of the hottest rivalries of the era, probably due to the close proximity to one another. But the BPD was on scene multiple times a day at the peak of this rivalry. Interval formed an alliance with the Magnolia Steelers and Columbia Road to become MIC, so it only made sense for the Brunswick Big Head Boys to link up with the Steelers' rivals Faison Street. Creston Street would join also on this side of the alliance against MIC. Interval is known for the Adidas tree located in a wooded lot off Interval Street where the crew would hang out. They had a couch, a TV, and a radio set up with extension cords running from nearby buildings. They used to barbecue, watch football games there, and do their dirt. The feds would eventually bulldoze the tree because they saw it as a symbol for the culture in the city. The tree was called the Adidas tree because it was adorned with sneakers that the guys would throw up there. Some Adidas, but not all. Some were confiscated pairs, some were donated, but it was just a part of Boston identifying with Adidas in the three stripes. Interful was considered at one time to be the single most dangerous street in the entire city. I heard that they wore Indian hats sometimes, but they were always identified as the Interval Posse. The Humble Raiders had one of the most brutal rivalries in the city with Castlegate Road through the late 80s and early 90s. Once again, the BPD was on the scene sometimes multiple times a day. The Castlegate, Humble, Interval, Brunswick rivalries made Grove Hall one of the hottest areas during the period. That's the point I'm trying to make. While Boston is the smallest city and doesn't have that type of reputation now, in these isolated areas during this time period, it was just as active as anywhere else. The Humble Raiders were, to say the least, a group with some enemies. While their most bitter hated rival was Castlegate, they had tension with the Fiat Academy Terra Home Braves and the Magnolia Steelers. And if three powerhouse rivals weren't enough, Heat Street, one of Boston's deepest projects who originally was an ally of the Humboldt Raiders back in the day, is now one of their biggest rivals. Humboldt, which eventually morphed into a group called H-Block in the 2000s, named for a group of streets that begin with the letter H that Humboldt is a part of. The Humboldt Raiders would end up taking a lot of heat from the authorities after a little girl, Tiffany Moore, who was visiting her mom, lost her life while sitting on top of a mailbox. Her mom had sent her to live with relatives because of how dangerous Humboldt had gotten. 
She was home visiting when the tragedy unfolded in the summer. She was just sitting on the mailbox in the middle of the day on Humboldt Ave when a rival Castlegate member missed his target. This tragedy was a reminder of how dangerous some of these neighborhoods had become for everyday citizens. Later when the authorities would put extreme pressure on the crew in the mid-90s when things had been out of control for too long, a member of the Humboldt, Freddy Cardoza, would be used as a poster boy by the authorities for what would happen if you did not heed their warnings. Freddy, who was known to authorities and was a prominent member, was stomped on Humboldt Ave one night for possessing a single round in his hand. No weapon, just a single round. I think it was more of a taunt to the police than anything else. But he was arrested and prosecuted in a federal judge went wild on him and sentenced him to 19 years in federal prison, I guess because of his prior convictions and stuff, but it's still crazy. Just as a side note, Freddy Cardoza passed away this summer, so I just want to say RIP and prayers to his family and friends. I figured it went without saying, but I'm just going to say it anyways. RIP and prayers to Tiffany Moore's family as well. I have a six-year-old and a two-year-old daughter, and I cannot imagine a 12-year-old girl just sitting on a mailbox in the middle of the day. What a tragedy. So I just want to say, obviously, if people are like, oh, you're going to say RIP and prayers to the guy's family, but you won't say about the little girl, obviously, to the little girl above anybody else. It's fair to say that a lot of these guys got the picture, and by the late 90s, a lot of them had gotten older and were sick of the violence. It's a dangerous, stressful existence, especially when you're surrounded by enemies all the time. Another member of the Humboldt Raiders knew all too well the traumas of this lifestyle. Angelo West, who had been Cardoza's co-defendant in a prior 1991 case, was hit nine times in 1994 in multiple locations. Can't help myself with the 50 cent guys. He had complications using him to use a catheter. A year later in 1995, a hooded assailant ran up on West as he sat on his front porch trying to finish the previous year's work. He was hitting his leg three times, shattering his femur bone in five places, causing permanent nerve damage to his foot, which he could no longer lift as a result. I would have to assume that living through multiple attempts in your life, along with the everyday fear of being surrounded by rivals, has to bring with it certain mental issues like PTSD and some sort of paranoia. West spent eight years in prison in 2001 after an altercation with police where he dared them to end him. Then unfortunately for Angelo West, in 2015, that's exactly what happened when after the 41-year-old was stopped on Humble Avenue, an altercation with a cop ensued. The cop was hit in the face and West did not survive the following events. It shows to me the stark reality of having to live this or choosing to live this life. It's a very dangerous, dark lifestyle. Heat Street, who I mentioned was at once cool with Humble Ave, is still to this day has a bitter rivalry with H Block, which Humboldt is now a part of. Heat Street has always been a dominant faction in the city. Even around 2010, the BPD estimated they had over 200 members. They had one of the biggest and most bitter rivals in the city, the Powerhouse Academy Terra Home Braves. They had both some of the deepest hoods in the city, and it was green light on sight. Many festivals have been ruined because of this particular rivalry. Heat Street had problems with the Eggleston Timberwolves as well. One of Heat Street's main allies was the legendary OP Trailblazers. This was one of the most powerful alliances in the city. A lot of people apparently referred to them as P-Kids. They formed a three-way alliance with the Mission Hill Wolverines. So as you guessed it, the dreaded Academy Terra Home Braves entered into an alliance with the Heat's other rivals, the Eggleston Timberwolves. And of course, Mission Hill's enemy, the Franklin Hill Giants, weren't about to stay out of the mix, linking up with Eggleston and Academy. So if you're starting to get the picture of how intricately woven all these alliances and rivalries were, it's something. It's really something. I hope this is starting to make a little more sense at exactly why and how Boston was so crazy. It's one thing just to say that Boston was different or dangerous, but to understand the actual levels of this is something else entirely. Orchard Park, home of Bobby Brown, had a legendary rivalry with the notorious Columbia Point Dogs. It's one of the most famous in the city. I'm not going to talk too much about that right now, but the dogs had so many different problems and rivals throughout the city, it was wild. The ever feuding Columbia Point dogs had smoke with powerhouses, the trailer places, Heat Street, and the Lennox Cardinals, but also Mount Pleasant Hood. I guess they just wanted all the smoke. 
Columbia Point's bitter rivals, the Lennox Cardinals, had a couple common enemies with OP. Besides just Columbia Point, both had smoke with the Ruggles Street projects, but as far as I know, they did not have an alliance. Lennox was cool with Mass Ave though, and they both had problems with 1850. Ruggles Street, who had problems with Lennox, joined up with 1850, who also had beef with the larger Lennox. Seeing as Ruggles had smoke with Mass Ave, and so did the Tent City Projects, they joined the Ruggles 1850 Alliance as well. Some other notable rivalries from the era were the Vamp Hill Kings vs. Columbia Road, Walnut Park and the Magnolia Steelers, Moss Street vs. Lucerne Street, Academy Braves against Brandon Street, Castlegate Road and the Norfolk Bulls, Highland Blackhawks and the OP Trailblazers, and the Shadowy X-Men against Mozart Park. Oozing Machismo says kids in JP were scared to say X-Men out loud because if you said their name, they might appear. I'm not going to go into extreme detail because I'm going to do a future video on the topic, but the Johnson brothers were main figures on Corbett Street in Dorchester, central to organizing that area in the early 80s. The younger cousin Tony Johnson by his teenage years was a legend in Boston. He was a standout athlete, a member of the almighty RSO, and most importantly a member of the Johnson family. Unfortunately for Tony though, his young hood style life came to an early and abrupt end in the summer of 1988. Although it wasn't related to one of the rivalries, this came at the hands of a member of one of the most dreaded and feared groups of the time, the Academy Terra Home Braves. Paul Lawrence Guild, aka LL, was what they call on the streets a problem. Dude started chilling with older guys at an early age of 14 and 15 in the Academy homes, and he dropped out of school in the ninth grade. He and an older guy tried to rob a laundromat where he was arrested, and LL went to DYS after admitting to discharging a weapon in the act of a crime. After DYS, things went insane. I went straight to jail at 18, I missed DYS, but let me say from my many friends and people I know, DYS and mass primarily Roslindale, aka Rosie, was probably as tough or tougher than many adult jails from the late 1980s to the early 2000s, gladiator school simply put. When LL came out, he was 10 times worse than before. He became a self-admitted vicious addict, smoking 10 bones a day, doing 20 wax foldies a down a day, 5 just to wake up, and he said every day that he sold hard, he also smoked. So let's just say this kid might have had a couple mental issues to begin with, but add all this on top and to put it simply, the kid was out of his mind. He got arrested shortly after getting out of DYS. Some other kid selling said something disrespectful to El, so he pulled out a blade and gave him a buck fifty across the face. He simply told the authorities the kid disrespected him, and the case ended up getting dismissed. The kid probably didn't want to testify. Can you really blame him? After that, he and other members of the Braves would rob other dealers and take their work and sell it. If dudes tried to set up shop on Braves territory, they dealt with them. He actually took another man's life, Joseph Sargent, simply again for being disrespectful to him. Sergeant tried to run after being hit in the knee, and Al coolly followed him and hit him again in the stomach, letting him bleed out on the street. Authorities didn't know this till after Tony Johnson's death. Guild openly told him about Sergeant. Apparently, LL claims Tony Johnson's death wasn't over Corbett and Academy, it was something personal. Apparently, something happened between Johnson and a female that LL was acquaintances with. He claimed he wasn't looking for Johnson, but he was cruising around the Corbett area with a sawed off. He saw him and as soon as he did, he jumped out of the vehicle and walked up to Johnson. He hit him in the leg and then again in the face and throat and he left him in his driveway during a summer rainstorm. Police and EMTs arrived to find Johnson in his driveway pinned between his car and a bunch of garbage bags. The police and first responders were throwing the trash bags to try to get to him while rivers of rainwater flowed down the driveway. It was a terrible and chaotic scene. At 21, Johnson was a hood star and a legend. Boston and especially Corbett Street and Dorchester area certainly felt this loss. LL was arrested shortly after for the crime and admitted to it. Lawrence Gill changed his name to Abdul Nadi Rule Islam while in prison. Family members say they prayed for him when he was young, but they couldn't do anything for the kid. He broke down his cousin's door once to steal his service weapon. His cousin was a Boston cop. He's serving life in prison and he was denied parole. He suffers from a lot of mental issues, but honestly, I think the streets are probably safer with him in there. He's an extreme case, but as a whole, the Academy Braves were no joke. So on a little side thing, a lot of people in the last video, in the comments, they were asking about Codman Square. 
The little that I do know about Codman Square and 700 block is that their main rivals were four corners who roll with Crown Path. So Codman Square has smoke with them too. Four Corners and Crown Path both wore Pittsburgh Pirate hats, sometimes Phillies. It's like a common trend for people who wear Pirates, sometimes wear Phillies too. Benzino, the great Benzino, is from Four Corners. I think historically that neighborhood had a big Jamaican and Somalian population, if I'm correct in my ethnic you know, history that I'm always, you know, for some reason curious about. No, it's Fields Corner, not Four Corners that has that population, I believe. <laughs> So Codman Square is a huge hood. Along with 700 block, KFC is calibrated with Codman, Millet Street and Spencer down Talbot Ave. There's the Southern Ave crew. Not far from Codman Square is Wainwright Park and Morris Street along with the Stockton Street crew. That area gets it in for sure. Someone else was asking about Lucerne Street. The Lucerne Street dogs got major problems with Moore Street. Around the area of Blue Hill Ave and Morton Street, you got the Deering Road crew up by the gas station. There's also Wilson Street and Almond Park. And there's the Wilcox Street guys who are like a block away from the Chevu roller rink, which is a very popular spot. One of the major situations or events that capped off how intense this period was and the insanity of the rivalries the Morning Star Baptist Church on 1257 Blue Hill Ave in Mattapan was the scene of an incredible melee. It was like a scene of a movie or something you hear about in South Central in its heyday or Chirac. But no, it was in Mattapan. At a funeral for Robert Odom, a young man, I think he was like 20, he lost his life standing in front of a window at a party. He was caught by an errant round. Now I can't completely confirm this, but I believe it was the Vamp Hill Kings who entered the church, but I'm not entirely sure about that. They were a wild group with many rivals, but other men, possibly Vamp Hill Kings, stormed the service and began a melee inside the church attacking people. One man was seriously wounded by a blade and blast went off as well. Like I said, it was like a scene from a movie. I've actually seen live footage of what unfolded after when everything spilled out of the church, which is kind of rare for 92, which is way before smartphones and everything was being filmed. It was insane though. 21 year old Annie Barber, who poked 21 year old Jerome Brunson inside the church, was caught and detained by the BPD. But in the meantime, about 40 enraged mourners from Odom's funeral spilled out and went after Barber. The police tried to keep people back and protect Barber, who was handcuffed at the time and also getting thumped on by multiple people. All this was caught on film. If you dig deep enough, you can find it. While it definitely has a wow factor, and it's a clear indicator of a city and a community that was coming apart at the seams. By 92, the violence had been non-stop for years, and everyone was growing weary of it. Showing that these guys didn't respect a funeral and caused this type of chaos was a clear indicator of how bad things had gotten in the bean by then. Also, I feel like I gotta mention this before I bring this baby home. If we're talking about unique situations to Boston, then we have to mention the Cape Verdean conflict. First off, there's no other city with a large Cape Verdean population, and the city of Boston is its own category right off the bat there. Boston and Eastern Mass have more Cape Verdeans than in the actual islands of Cabo Verde. I grew up with a close Cape Verdean friend. Crazy dude. Shout out Shuggy if you're still alive. Uh, if he is, he's probably somewhere grinding his teeth, unfortunately. But the large Cape Verdean population that centers mostly around Dorchester and Upham's Corner was quiet through much of the 1980s. Cape Verdeans are strict Catholics, and this was enforced in their home. Many were quiet and kept to themselves, but in 1995, an argument escalated into a physical altercation, and a larger young man, Bobby Mendez, got the better of a younger and smaller Nato Lopes. Nato stuck Bobby, and he ended up losing his life on the Dorchester Street. Nato initially called police and reported what he did, but then he panicked and fled. He remained a fugitive for over 10 years. He actually got married and was living a normal life in Maryland before he got apprehended. His brother Gus Lopes took up his cause, turning his brother's name into a legend on the Boston streets. He even went so far as to get a tattoo that said, God forgives, Nato doesn't. It started a tit-for-tat cycle between the two sides. The Mendez side, which resided on Wendover Street, took that name as their identity and began seeking out friends and associates of Lopes for retribution. Lopes' people, who were over on Stonehurst, they became associated with that name. Gus Lopes started trying to eliminate witnesses against his brother so he could come home. It wasn't very realistic thinking. 
Eventually, the groups would morph into more established street organizations, Stonehurst linking up with the Cape Verdean Outlaws, or the CVO. Columbia Road became the demarcation line between Stonehurst, CVO, and Wendover. Wendover would link up with the Cape Verdean Posse, or the CVP, later. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail about this because I already made a video about some of it earlier, which now, five months later, I've gotten a little bit better at this process. I think I'm going to make another better start-to-finish video on the entire Cape Verdean conflict at some point. Somebody left a reply in a comment in the last video, and I'm not sure if it was directed at me or someone else, but basically it was saying, like, what do you really know about this situation? And again, obviously, I've experienced none of this firsthand, and I don't claim to have. People who like my videos have been kind enough to take the time to tell me their stories and firsthand experience, all anonymously, I must add, wanting nothing, no money or recognition, just trying to share their experiences and firsthand knowledge. And without this, this video would not be possible. I just have to put that out there. The Cape Verdean conflict isn't really part of the sports team situation, but it is a huge part of overall Boston lore and one of Boston's biggest historical rivalries. It's even spilled over outside the city into Brockton, New Bedford, Fall River, and Pawtucket, Rhode Island, and beyond. It's still going on to this very day. That's mostly what I spoke about in the previous video. I did outlay the history of Nato and Bobby Mendez, but I was speaking about G. Fredo and Cameron and the NOB. But now during this current video, I'm positive that I missed some things or got something wrong, but overall there's more information here than you'll find in any other video about this topic. I can absolutely guarantee that. Again, thank you so much to my anonymous friend who was so instrumental in making of this video. Also, thank you to everyone that contributes to the comment section, adds information, and a sense of Boston camaraderie. Shout out to my new buddy Sean, who I chop it up with. He gives me all types of information on the time period. I was trying to find the name on the of his handle in the comments. I believe it's NHA Tube. He was like an original member in the Cape Verdean conflict. Uh, he was, you know, giving going back and forth in the comments with me too. Um, shout out to all my old subscribers, new subscribers. Thank you to everybody that contributes. Time to bring it home. So like I said, this is a video I've wanted to make since I started my channel. I'm so grateful for all the help in getting it done. Kind of hoping it'll get some attention, just for the simple fact that there's nothing else out there with this type of information on the whole web. Mostly because I think Boston deserves its credentials up there with any other city that's always in the conversation. Boston's never in the conversation. Boston's a unique project and street culture is a mystery to most people not from the city, and it's not hard to figure out why. It's incredibly complex and layered, but it exists. Still to this day, and during the 80s and 90s, and even to a certain extent the mid-2000s, it was just as active as anywhere else. I really hope you guys enjoyed this journey into a world not known to many who live outside of it. Much love and respect to all Boston hoods mentioned in this video. My prayers to all those who have lost loved ones in the street. Hit the like button if that's how you are feeling right now. Subscribe if you're not already subscribed. We're like one subscriber away from 4,000. Come on, let's go guys. If you guys are with me, I'm with you. From the guys who've been here since the beginning, some people have just subscribed today. Threes and Bs. Let's give Boston some respect. Have a great week. Like always, guys, make good choices, make good decisions. Take care of yourselves, your friends, your family, your fellow human beings. Have a great day. I'll talk to you guys later.